Welcome to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. Join us as we share our favorite RPGs, one-shot games, tabletop games, reviews, and convention panels. Sit back and enjoy the show. Hi, this is Kelly, a.k.a. Trixie from Ragnarok and Roll, a sign to Ragnarok story, and Tilda Wimblewick from D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition. First off, I would just like to say thank you to everyone for listening to our varied adventures, as well as for rating us on iTunes and RPGpodcast.com. If you haven't rated us yet, we would greatly appreciate it if you could. And if you're looking for more ways to support our efforts, we are now on Patreon, a great site where you can help us continue making more podcasts, as well as some special surprises for our patrons. If you can, please look us up at www.patreon.com slash cppn. Every little bit helps. And again, thank you for listening. Yeah, hi, Barbie. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Barbie. <laughs> Hello, Barbie. Let's go party and subvert the narrative. Woo. <laughs> Welcome to our panel. Um, we're going to start with uh, introductions. Of course, we're all Barbie, but we're going to tell you a little bit about our kind of Barbie that we are. Barbie, would you like to start? <laughs> Awkward Barbie. <laughs> and we like to pass it on to the next Barbie. <laughs> oh. I'm sorry, Awkward Barbie. I thought you were also Awkward Artist Barbie. I am. Oh, and Photographer Barbie. That's right. Mm-hmm. This is Photographer Barbie. Mm-hmm. Um, Goth Barbie. <laughs> yes. Aww. I also enjoy a lot of nerdy things and talking about them. Thanks, Goth Barbie. Thanks. I'm finance Barbie, but in my free time, I'm introverted Barbie. Aww. <laughs> Thanks, Barbie. Thanks, Barbie. Hi, I'm obnoxious Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> and in my free time, I'm obsessed with hats and tea, and I pretend to be professionally English. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wait, 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 yes. wait Barbie, this yes. is directed towards Barbie. Thank um, you. Um, <laughs> uh, do you know Corset Barbie? I do know Corset Barbie. I, um, I'm Corset Barbie on the weekdays. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, so I'm, I'm many kinds of Barbie. <laughs> Actually, what I am is demented Barbie. <laughs> so, uh, and also, uh, just before we get into it, spoiler warning, there will be spoilers. <laughs> so today, we're going to discuss how the movie sub- Inverted our Barbie expectations, challenging the narrative around girl power and unpack some of the issues of second wave feminism. And uh, if you want the full blurb, I'm happy to give that to you. Should I do it? You want it? Sure, Barbie. Sure. Sure. Thanks, Barbie. It's okay, Barbie. No one could have predicted the record shattering success of the Barbie movie. (laughs) Fueled by word of mouth and think pieces, the film's debut captured the zeitgeist and unleashed a fashion moment. More than that, it launched a thousand discussions between friends and fans, exploring philosophy, feminism, and what it means to be Kenna. (laughs) We'll jump into a fantastic conversation and unpack this glamour in pink. Yeah, that's where we're at. So, can we have another color besides pink? Not today. <laughs> this is pink today. I am definitely wearing pink from head to toe. Pink. 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 There's pink. Everyone's wearing pink today. Only you're in pink. I'm so sorry. It's pink. You walk through that door, transforms. <laughs> so what you're, I really hear you saying is we're all in the pink. We are. Yeah. Not sure. So, uh, we're going to get into it. We, uh, we're going to start with the opening for reasons. If you've seen the film, you know. Yes. Um, uh, photographer Barbie? Yes. You're going to hear about the opening. Yes. And we're going to prepare you for how much you need to see this opening. I, I look forward to piecing in the uh, TikToks that I've watched. Right. <laughs> Excellent. So, finance Barbie. Yes. Would you like to start? Talking about the opening? No. Only <laughs> 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 because I don't feel like I can do it justice. I 
just saw it last night. I was late to the movie. Oh, okay. sure. So I saw it last night, and I'm like, this is the most glorious opening I've ever seen. So I will it's say that. Amazing. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Did you both just see the movie for the first time last night? No, I'd seen it. Oh, okay. Just, I was late to the theater, and so I, I had missed the opening. Oh, my God. Okay. And so last night, I saw the opening for the first time, oh, and I thought it was spectacular. It but, is. Well, great. Yeah. All right. Be prepared to jump in. <laughs> you too. Goth Barbie. Yes. Would you like me to take lead on this, or would you like to dive in with some thoughts on the opening? I don't want to dive in a little bit. Please dive in, Goth Barbie. Like that. The oh, like the opening was in the very like the initial teasers for the movie. And I'll be honest, I was one of those people that was like, Barbie movie. <laughs> well, Margot Robbie's in it, so it's probably going to be good. But when that that opening, like that whole thing. Over 2001 A Space Odyssey, where it's like these girls laying gray, brown, dirt things, like, oh, they're baby dolls, and that's all there is for them, and then just, Barbie appears. <laughs> and it was so good. <laughs> and they, I mean, they even used the music. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing. It's like, because then, like, these girls see that there's options. There's a, there's options of toys besides just pretending to, pretending to have baby dolls and, like, being told that that's the only thing you can do. When it's like, no, you can actually be tall and powerful and just amazing. And glamorous. It was great. So I appreciate 2001. Space Odyssey for the fine work of art it is. Yeah. But I found once was enough. <laughs> it may have been because I was sober at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, good on them for creating a wonderful work of art. However, Barbie has elevated it forever into <laughs> yet the beyond <autumn> glory. <laughs> I immediately was in the theater, I was like started cackling and I, I could hear the other geeks because it was like we were calling to each other in the room with the cackle. I was like, yes, geek! Hello, <laughs> oh, geek! I too have geeky Harvey. <laughs> and like I was uh, surrounded by some young people who were sort of like what? The olds. <laughs> the olds are so weird. And it's like, <laughs> there will be a Google thing piece and you will learn. <laughs> yes. Barbie. Yes, uh, Barbie. This is, again, this is directed towards Barbie. Yes, um, obnoxious Barbie. Yes, Thank obnoxious you. Barbie. Yeah. <laughs> um, were you, were there, were you amongst, were there the mother-daughter duets amongst you all dressed in pink? There were. So it was, so as a, uh, uh, an aside, or like to answer your question, so I've been to see it in the theater three times um, because I loved it so much. <laughs> and uh, the first time I went was in that first uh, rush of excitement, and uh, the all of the people coming in, there was just a sea of pink everywhere. Um, there was one wonderful gaggle of queers coming in who like. Um, they had bow ties and blazers and vests and like oh, neck wow. scarves and they and they brought their girls with them and they were like, come, oh, we're shepherding you in, cis women, come with us. <laughs> oh, that's great. That was great. So yeah, it was like queer moms, daughters, weird middle aged ladies like me, and it was beautiful and there was a lot of me. Um, were, yeah. there any, were there any men? Uh, yes, yes, there were men. Other than the, the other person. than the queer men, uh, yeah, there were the occasional boyfriends who looks like, and maybe husbands, partners who looks like they were not sure what was happening. <laughs> Soon you will know, and we'll see if you're still a husband, partner, or boyfriend. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck. Are you enough? We'll find out. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I feel like the opening really sets the tone, and um, I knew going in this was going to be more than just an homage to Barbie, it was gonna be like, unpacking some nonsense. Yeah, so. I mean, like, to that point, um, well, first of all, to talk about like, <coughs> the way people dress, we're dressing for like the opening couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. The things that I thought were very sweet were the pictures you'd see where like, the the guys were also treating it as like got you know joined in with their partners as it was an occasion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And then back to the opening a little bit. In, in my like observance of sci-fi geekdom and culture, 2001 A Space Odyssey always seems to be treated and discussed as like a guy movie because I don't like I've always wanted really guys to talk about it. I think that's a really so good observation. I think it's really funny and delightful that it was sort of subverted this way. Absolutely. And another thing I where like you kind of get an idea in when the trailer the rest of the trailer started to come out about what type of movie this might be is I noticed like as I have a, like I have a friend who was just delightfully obsessed and was just like nobody talked to me about anything but this movie until like this is my entire personality now for a while <laughs> and uh, we were talking about the trailer and how much we liked it and and it's like I noticed that when they're playing that song she'll have fun 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 that's all it is yeah. it's mm -hmm. just that part on a loop mm -hmm. and it never goes any farther and then it start like the tone of it kind of changes occasionally and it's like this movie's going to be a lot more interesting than I initially thought it would be. <laughs> and like, I want to jump on this before we move on, uh, because you said something that I sort of observed but hadn't articulated. 2001 A Space Odyssey is an important piece of work. Yeah. It's artistic. It's part of sort of like the, the higher elevated art of science fiction and also of, of artful movie maker making. And um, it is part of that bastion of male auteur cinema makers. And that bastion is not always broken into by people who don't fit that mold, uh, who are white, cis, male, um, often hetero. And so this was another thing where like, not only are we going to be taking some unpacking of feminism but also we are coming for the establishment like we are not going to be precious about anything mm -hmm. everything is up for uh caricature everything's up for satire everything's up for critique even your sacred horses of sci-fi cinema and i was like i'm ready i'm strapped in <laughs> yeah yeah so i think the opening is like essential to the experience, and I'm glad you got to see it. Yes, me too. Yeah, I was like so tired. We were watching Barbie last night. I'm like, okay, I'm ready. And then that scene came on, and I was like, oh my god, I can't believe I missed this. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. It's mm -hmm. amazing. Uh, the the voiceover is just great. Yeah. So, and spoiler, that's Helen Mirren. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, Barbie. <laughs> um, so before we get into the unpacking, and I'm so sorry, Shelby, we are gonna get to you. I'm sorry, Barbie, for talking. <laughs> I'm gonna stay in a moment. Uh, we're gonna spoil some moments for you. Are you ready? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, Goth Barbie, I'd like to start with you actually, because you saw it for the first time last night. And so uh, my sort of opening is like, please share a fate, one of many, I'm sure, but please share a favorite moment from the movie. <laughs> there, a part early on, like there's a lot of really good, good humor in it. And like, I have like favorite moments that were just like really poignant and were just like, oh my feelings. And then I have the moments where I was just sitting next to to, uh, to obnoxious Barbie, just cackling <laughs> like a mad woman. And one of those moments was at the end of the, like, the big rager party. And Ken's like, hey. And she's like, why are you still here? <laughs> and he's like, well, you know. And he's, you know, carrying on and just like, I don't want you here anymore. Why are you here today? It's just so good. So good. Because I feel like like I have had an experience like that when I was in high school with a guy. Mm -hmm. Where it was just like after a movie and he like walks through the door and I'm just like, alright, bye, because I didn't think of that as a date. And 
he just was standing there and I was like, well, good night. <laughs> so yeah, I love that for the humor. Yeah, it was great. It is a really funny moment. And also, I think a really relatable moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you have been a, a, a fan of any variety dating, <laughs> you have had that moment. <laughs> uh, so, Shelby, I'm going to rope you in on this and just uh, come on. Photography Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Barbie. I don't know. I am actually demented Barbie, and so I'm in multiple timelines. It's very confusing. Um, so would you think about, while I chat with our dear friend, account accounting Barbie, finance Barbie, um, think about a special moment you had with a Barbie girl. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can I have two, please? You may have two. All right. Uh, of course, Barbie. Thank you, I'm Barbie. Generous. Oh, I'm generous. You can have another. Oh, okay. So I have to say, I am not generally a big crier in the theater. I don't like people to see me cry, right? Mm -hmm. And I didn't expect to cry at the Barbie movie, but I did in two places. The first one is Barbie's in the real world, and she's sitting at the bus stop, and she looks over at this old woman, and she says, you're so beautiful. I'm going to cry. Right? <laughs> I'm going to cry. I'm going to cry. Because we don't look at women of a certain age as beautiful. And thank you. I'm going to cry. <laughs> like, I'm getting to that certain age where I don't feel beautiful. And she just looked at her and told her that. And she's like, I know. And I'm like, yeah, go. Yeah. And then the other one was America's um, monologue where she's talking about you have to be a team player, but you have to be a leader, right? And you have to be pretty, but you can't be too pretty. And all of those um, discrepancies that run around in your mind, um, I will just say, I, we were talking about this, I had a behavioral scientist that works at my company, came in to talk about women. Right? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? <laughs> yeah. That's that my exact reaction. Was this like male? Yes. This male. Oh god. So it's still the male that one, sir. Correct. He was being interviewed by one of my dear friends who was trying to be careful. And um, anyway, he pretty much said her monologue. Like, well, you know, women have to do this, but they have to do this, but they have to do this. And Andy's like, I'm not saying women have to do everything, but I'm like, but you are. Mm -hmm. You just said we have to do everything. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I guess when I got to that point in the movie, and I had heard it before I'd seen the movie, I'd, I'd seen clips of it, I just, I cried because it hit home so hard. Like, I just don't know how to be everything. You know? That's because it's not possible, Barbie. No, Barbie, it's not. No, Barbie, it's not. No. 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 Um, <clears throat> photography, Barbie. Yeah. I know you haven't had a chance to see the film, but you have had a chance to interact with small Barbie. Yes. Do you have a special moment that was, like, empowering when you were... I know you are like, Barbie was not necessarily your milieu, oh, but... I just saw Barbie's my, What I remember... Mm -hmm is I wasn't playing. My sister was obsessed with Barbies. Actually, mom still has all her Barbies. And what I remember is she had her best friend over, and they played for days oh, at Barbie. Cool. They would come out, get their <laughs> snacks, grab a piece of bacon, not bacon, bologna, because that was going to be, they cut it out and they'd eat a turkey. And it was, so, you know, as an, at the time, I thought it was cute, but as an adult, I'm like, that was really precious time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she, my sister gave her, they were still friends for a while, and gave her, when they got older, she gave her a, a little box that said Barbie's Forever. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. No, I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> and then you tried to trap the cat in the Barbie house. <laughs> 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 we had him in there, but he could get through the little window. We were impressed. We just kept putting him in there. So um, there's so many amazing moments in this uh, film, and you you captured several of my favorites. 
Um, but I think there, there's this great moment with Weird Barbie, and she's like showing the high heel and the broken stuff. And she's like, you've got a choice. And she's like, listen, you did not have a choice. You only get the one where you find out. You have to find out. And I was only giving you a choice to make you feel better. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, Barbie, I, I feel that. That is very real. <laughs> so, taking these moments, they're so like poignant and full of emotion and connection and empowerment and, and like, uh, rage and, and and laughter and a reminder of things we've gone through. We're we're sort of diving into this moment, this movie that is about some really cool but complex um, philosophical things like existential despair, um, identity, and impossible beauty standards. And um, I think. The opening of the movie talks a lot about how every day is the best day. Tomorrow will be the best day. Yesterday was the best day. Everything is perfect all the time. And so I wanted to like touch a little bit on when a perfect day is a prison. Because you can't be real if you're perfect. And you can't experience autonomy and decision and choice if everything is perfect. So, uh, yeah. I feel like I'm in corporate America and all they want to talk about these days in their employee surveys is being your authentic self. <laughs> if I have to hear about being your authentic self at work again, I'm going to vomit. Because you have to be perfect at work. Let's be honest. You have to be perfect Barbie at work. It has to be the best day. You have to show this particular way of being. You have to be careful. Like I'm trying to get into leadership, but I can't be too bossy. Right? And I don't want to look like I'm not a team player. I don't want to look like I'm be too pushy. Right? I have to be smiley. I can't have a bad day. They, uh, I have a female leader who is, um, my dad died this year. And I, thank you, and I didn't take any extra time off, right? Um, but I, I did need some flexibility with going home. And um, she said to me, and then said to my leader, uh, she's two leaders up, but she, I thought she would be a little more flexible. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I thought maybe, you know, as a woman, she would be more flexible. Oh, we're going to come around to that. Yeah, <laughs> we will, right? <laughs> yes, we will. But, um, <laughs> but end story is that she was like, can you separate your home life from your work life? That was how she pretty much said, you're done mourning now, oh. right? And I hadn't even cried at work. Like, I mean, I didn't let it, I wasn't walking around like, I was trying to be really careful. And yeah, she was pretty much like, are you done now? Done now. And I thought, wow, authentic selves. Every day is the best day. Yeah. Yeah, Barbie. Um, Barbie, I would like to comment, and I first want to completely say that happens all so much. I'm going to validate that. Not that you can validate like. No, but thank you. Um, I've been, I've moved in my career as a cis white male, who I consider myself to be pretty liberal, and to be emotionally um, available. Um, and I've worked in all kinds of different jobs, and I've been in government for the last two years. And I feel like I'm super fortunate because my, I've been in an HR role. I've gone from a um, uh, very devout, strong tech role to a finance role to now I'm in an HR role. Mm -hmm. And I'm lucky enough to be working in a county government in Pima County, actually, um, where uh, I'm in a department with the best leadership team I have ever seen. And I've been in all kinds of companies and private, kind of private companies. And, and um, just to say, it is possible to find a, a niche with a leadership team that gets it. Yeah. Because we have three deputy directors and a director who have the highest level of emotional intelligence I have ever seen in leaders, and which is so different from what normally, what normally sees. And if had you been in our department mm -hmm. working on a leadership role, you could have picked a mentor, not necessarily even your direct report, and 
And we have this unique two-word mission statement, which is we deal with the community, and so our mission statement is we do everything, if it's an internal, external customer, with heart and urgency. And your person you're under would have, would have completely been up there. So it can't, on my whole point, it can't happen. It's not the norm in corporate America, but if you find the right top-down leadership, it can happen. So I just wanted to. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and I guess where I was surprised was because I was, I've had a lot of female leaders. I've been actually very lucky in that. I've had a lot of female leaders, and I expected this female leader to be a little bit more understanding and kind. Yeah, and it hurt me. I was like, wow. So. Yeah. And what I see in the HR role is typical. Uh, Barbie, typically the fact that one considers that they have to overcompensate to be in that role, which isn't always true, but that seems to be the mindset. And I, just, and I wanted to mention, in our um, of our top leaders, mid-level and up, 50% um, are women, mm -hmm. and about 30% are minority, and two of our deputy directors are women. So it's an unusual situation. I just want to mention. Thank you, Barbie. Thanks, You're welcome, Barbie. And thank you, Barbie. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Barbie. You're welcome. Barbie. Yes. When my dad passed away, I worked in town, and that could really go into different directions, usually south. Um, I was fortunate where my store manager was very sympathetic because she lost her dad. Mm -hmm. On Father's Day. Oh, oh wow. Super cool. Um, <laughs> what was interesting, she's like, take as much time as you need. She asked me to come back because she really needed someone reliable for um, inventory. And I came back. So she was very understanding because I, I worked at CVS, and the CVS I worked at, a lot of the nurses were the ones that helped my dad. Oh. And so everyone saw uh, the nurse that my dad. Um, was on duty when my dad passed. Mm -hmm. I helped him and I called. She would let me give her a call. And she would come uh, on the register and uh, she would give me go to the closet. I said, yeah. So she would let me go to the closet and she would say, I would cry. And I'd come back. What well, was the start difference was she had male assistant managers. And one of them says, told me, goes, you talk about your dad away. <laughs> yeah. Do you need spiritual help? What? Wow. And I'm like, I'm <laughs> like, <laughs> 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 and I tooled over and I told Colleen what happened. And she says, I'll take care of it. And then I had another one when my grandmother passed away. And I knew I was going to have problems when, when grandma passed away because I'm the oldest grandmother and she was just special. And I spiraled hard. I was like, ready to check out. And I realized I need to go home. So I told the assistant manager, I said, Ryan, I need to go home. Um, I'm having problems. I need to go home. And he goes, he goes, well, why? And I said, I said, I'm, I'm having a mental breakdown. And he goes, well, can you work tomorrow at 10? <gasps> <laughs> and so I, went, I, I was like, oh, and, 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 I, and I went like this. <laughs> I'm really trying hard not to kill myself. I need to go. And so he's like, okay, I guess you have to go. I'm like, oh, he's out. Oh, that's all. And so I left, and then um, Colleen found out that I left, but she had no idea why. And I said, you need to have a conversation with your assistant. And he was just like, no. I told her what happened. She was like, that's not exciting. So she, I was so fortunate that my store manager in a retail setting actually had a heart. Because otherwise I could have. Gone. I would have left because I, I have to hear my mom. Yeah. And I'm like, I would have left. Peace out. I'm sorry, Marty. It's okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, Marty. I learned that. That sucks, Marty. Yeah. I got through. But I won. Excellent. But you know what, Barbie? Barbie, that we are going to come to this, but that's a lot of that girl boss vibe where you're like supposed to. Be authentic in a packageable, marketable way that makes people comfortable. 
and his perfect appearing, <coughs> with no unpleasant emotions for mm -hmm. people to consume. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I want to get to that, and uh, I don't want to gloss over these painful moments, because they are rough, mm -hmm. but I want to help us get through our conversation. Yeah, let her go. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I just want to like let you know, I don't want to... No, I, I took a tangent yeah. and I ran yeah. <laughs> Have you ever thought about death? Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah. 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 Have you thought about death? Thanks for bringing in the thoughts of death, Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Goth Barbie might have some thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, like, thing. I just, that moment was amazing to me because I love The Good Place. Mm -hmm. And there's a scene in The Good Place where, in one of the scenes of The Good Place, where Michael is just like totally unhinged and they're having this party and he's just like, Death is a curse and existence is a prison! <laughs> <laughs> and the part when Barbie's just dancing is like, Hey, do you ever think about dying? And it's like, it's like they're spiritual siblings. <laughs> So beautiful. And like the whole thing about the perfect day being in prison, and it's not just, and it also can just be like within yourself. Because sometimes if you have, I'm sorry, it's gonna be a little more, a little real again, but like if you have certain health conditions, sometimes people only wanna hear, wanna say, good, you know, you go, and you're such a fighter, and you're so inspirational, and they don't want to hear about all the messy, gross, horrible things that go with your condition. They just want to say, they just want to hear, and yeah, this is, this is me, I have breast cancer. And it's like, you can tell them all, hey, I have cancer, and go, oh no, this is terrible for you. And then you have people that are like, supportive for a while. And then they get to a certain point, and it's like they don't, they think you're just over it now. <laughs> a few months, like a few months go by, and then it's like, oh, you're better though, right? Because they want, there's a culture of toxic positivity where everybody wants to only hear about good things. You know, good vibes only. Good vibes only can suck my dick. Thank you. <laughs> and then they will be good vibes only. I have Thank this, you, Barbie. Someone I, somebody that I know on Facebook posted something one day that was like only, I don't know, it was along those lines. I had such a visceral reaction, I almost unfriended them. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was, no. But it's like, I wanted to talk, I wanted to like talk about having cancer, but I struggled initially because I'm like, I know how people are. And I, I don't know how much I want to say. And then one of my friends was like, this is your space on the internet, and you get to say whatever you want. And if somebody doesn't like it, they don't have to read it, and you don't have to keep them around. It was, she said it in like probably a less blunt-ish <laughs> way, but that's what she said, and it was really kind and compassionate, and I was like, thank you. So I am going to say whatever I want. <laughs> Good job, Barbie. Thanks, Barbie. Go, Barbie. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Barbie. So, of course, I'm an overachiever, Barbie, as well as unhinged and obnoxious, Barbie. <laughs> I'm multifaceted. Um, it's a, I don't think we'll get through everything, but uh, I do want to take a moment to talk about the fallen arches and the fall from grace. So this oh, is yeah. like. To me, it was very symbolic that when Barbie's feet were no longer in this impossible, like, little position, um, that it was like suddenly she was flawed. And that is like, on one hand, so are all of we. And it's great because we're human and real like the Velveteen Rabbit. But uh, for her, she'd been living in her perfect day in her prison. And being imperfect was the key from that prison, but it is a painful key. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if that's just my comment, and we don't have to have a conversation, but if you have some thoughts on that, I would be delighted to hear them. Barbies? I think, that, I think that's good. Yeah, yeah pretty much encapsulated. So, but that leads us into the temptation of maintaining the status quo. And girl, girl boss vibes, problem of white feminism and second wave feminism, which is like, well, we did it, 
And if you just lean in hard enough and you like separate your work life from your personal life, then can't you succeed like the men? Because isn't patriarchy not a problem? <laughs> And yet, we're still making 70 cents on the dollar. Right, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So, um, would any of you like to talk about girl boss vibes? The only thing I'm really thinking about, when, it, when you think about the girl boss vibe, is the most recent season of the Harley Quinn animated series. Mm -hmm. Because Poison Ivy gets put in charge of the Legion of Doom. Mm. And Talia Al Ghul comes around and like, oh, congratulations, you're now like an evil villainous CEO like the rest of us. And she invites her to these luncheons where it's that whole vibe of like, yes, queen, we're, you know, we're like ladies in power, and look at us go. But they're not actually going, to, they're not actually doing anything to change anything. And Poison Ivy gets really, it starts to get really angry because she's like, but this is what I want to do. And they're like, but you can't really do that. I mean, you still have to make it seem like they're in charge. And she's like, no, I'm in charge. <laughs> and she gets angry and the whole thing goes great. But that's kind of how, like, it was what I kind of think about with the whole girl boss thing. It's like these like important ladies go on chat shows and they have TED Talks where they talk about how how we need to change the dynamic and we, we're getting into power and isn't it wonderful? But then the, like some of they don't it's like nothing ever really happens to make it it doesn't seem like anything in corporate America ever because I work in corporate America too. It doesn't really seem like they like anybody's trying to actively change anything. Because if you look at a lot of corporations People can talk about like girl boss stuff all day long, but a lot of corporations, including the one I work for, the upper management structure is all a bunch of like middle-aged or middle-aged or old white guys with like really dated mindsets. So I yeah. think the other toxic thing about girl boss that's going around lately is that there's this idea and it comes from like women trying to make some extra side hustle, right? Mm -hmm. I hear girl boss for a lot of my friends that are trying to start up side businesses. Mm -hmm. They have this idea that they have to work full time, they have to be the perfect mom, and they have to have this entrepreneurial side hustle and be a girl boss in order to achieve the perfect family, the perfect, um, I mean, and these are my friends who are selling like Scentsy or, you know what I mean? They're like, they're doing pyramids, and there's nothing wrong with that if you like that. I'm not saying there is. I'm just saying they're working their asses off. I, I see them like going live and doing all this stuff, and they've got all of them have girl boss shirts and girl boss um, water bottles. And I guess my point in bringing it up is there's this idea that they have to be everything to achieve this dream of of what their family structure is going to look like and they're making 70 cents on the dollar and they're working the second Etsy job or doing whatever on the side to try to make more money for their family and feel like they're in charge and it's a myth. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't have to have kids, two jobs, you know, it shouldn't have to be that way for them and I feel like that girl boss moniker that's gotten put on all of that, it's just this myth. Right. Yeah, it, it's the kind of myth that women are, in many ways, it's like women are taught or like shown that this is, if you would like to succeed, this is what you need to do. There are no other options. Success is only defined by how much you hustle and how much money you can make. And that is all that matters. Right. Is status and like status and money and who cares if your life behind your Instagram profile is literally falling apart. Mm -hmm. That's not what's important. Everything has to be perfect. Well said, Barbie. Thanks, so, Barbie. You've got the high heel Barbie, or you've got the reality of that Birkenstock Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Barbie. Barbie, yes. do you have any thoughts about girl boss vibes? I do. Yeah. You know, um, I own my own business. My sister owns her own business, you know, and she hates the term girl boss because it doesn't always go perfect, you know. She's she's had a hard two years. I mean, her, her boyfriend died, she, you know, then her 
started off with her dog dying the week before. Oh, no. It was a little bit I'm trying so hard not to tangent her. Better. <laughs> <laughs> um, she, she's like, I, I can't live up to this girl boss. I said, then don't. Be your own boss. Yeah, don't be your own boss. That's really I'm cool. like, you're amazing. You know, you're, you're Aaron, you're amazing. You're smart, you're capable. You know, if someone, screw them. Yeah. yeah. And I said, if you need another TED Talk from your yours for me, give me a call. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know I will offer my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> I think the Barbie movie really handles this in a lot of interesting ways, but they set up this utopia of girl boss vibes, where we've all leaned in and like achieved and we do all the jobs. And so hasn't that made everything perfect out in the real world? Because we can be anything here in this girl boss utopia. But like white feminism, second wave feminism, they forget that a rising tide can drown people if you forget to throw out a life raft or have additional boats or even to leave out the gangplank so other people can be on the boat with you. Thanks. Thanks, Barbie. I love you, Barbie. Barbie. That's kind of Barbie. It's like when they get into the real world and Barbie is experiencing being objectified for the first time. Oh my gosh. Oh my and God. she's like, there's a construction site. We need some of that strong feminine energy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Barbie. <laughs> oh, Barbie. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that dramatic irony as the viewer. Yeah watching that come and know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, just like, I'm feeling very conscious, but conscious of myself. And I'm like, oh, Barbie. Yeah. Oh, Barbie. Oh. Well, and, and Ken says, I feel admired with no undertones of violence. <laughs> Well, a lot actually about this challenge of perfection and the the sort of way it can imprison you and and keep Barbies from having a real full honest life. But there's also hope in the movie. It's not mm -hmm. just existential despair. <laughs> uh, there's also the hope of weird Barbie, the brats and and the diverse collective of Barbies. So even though we're following stereotypical Barbie's journey, which I think is important because she's very emblematic of white feminism, second wave feminism, the girl boss vibes, she's not the only Barbie. There are no. lots of Barbies. Mm -hmm. We're all Barbies. And the Barbie movie really, you know, it's imperfect. Everything is worthy of critique, but it does have an amazing array mm -hmm. of um, Barbies, diversity. So uh, I'd like to ask, you all, my darling Barbies, how, what do you think of when I say to you that being flawed is important? And how the Barbie movie may have like brought that home to you? I want to think about it. Okay, I'll let you think about it. I want to think about the it. importance of being flawed. The importance of being flawed. Like weird, weird Barbie. Because I think that if you're flawed, then maybe you can look at things in different ways than everybody else. Because I really kind of love it. Weird Barbie was the one who was like, all right, let's get her over here. Mm -hmm. Like, she helped sort of like, I mean, obviously, like Gloria and her daughter were the ones who were able to like help fix it. But Weird Barbie was like, we gotta make a plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also, perfect is boring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Taking over school. <laughs> <laughs> that was exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> Do you have a psychic mind by Barbie? I guess I'm a psychic Barbie now. Yeah, you're, psychic. <laughs> you're a psychic Barbie now. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, perfect is boring. I mean, 
and you just, you know, you look around and see, you know, people's imperfections. And, you know, going back to my sister, she loves kids with glasses and braces. She thinks they are the cutest things on the planet. And that's something I've always loved about her. And she loves what somebody would think was their embarrassment or what was ugly about them. Mm-hmm. And she just loves it. And she sits in and you're so cute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Barbie. Yeah. You're welcome. And I think that, now that I've thought about it a little more, yeah. uh, with the flaws, you know, we, we internally hold ourselves to such standards, don't we? You know, of what we think perfection is f- for us or for other people. And I think they're unrealistic expectations. And by embracing the flaws, right, there's a lot more grace we give to ourselves and other people. And I think yeah. that's a really important lesson mm-hmm. from the movie. Yeah. yeah. And again, it's this sort of like key to liberation from that prison that is the girl boss vibes and the promise of second wave feminism, which clearly is a failed promise, mm-hmm. that we can never be perfect enough or good enough or work hard enough to convince people who wish to oppress us that we are worthy of being human beings. Yeah. So maybe we can just be humans, Barbie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that being human is a state of being flawed. and. Um, it makes me always think of the Velveteen Rabbit because the rabbit is only a human or a real or alive once it is very flawed. Mm. So, and now I'm crying again. So, <laughs> but the, the pathway to liberation from patriarchy and the, uh, you know, Ken's taking over Barbie land is not only through uh, finding our imperfections and flat feet and cellulite and the ways in which we don't measure up to an impossible perfection, it is also the ways in which all of Barbie land, who is not indoctrinated, comes together, including Alan mm-hmm. and Sugar Daddy Ken <laughs> and Harry Magic Ken and Midge and like. Pump up the volume, Scooter. The <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> is growing up, Scooter. <laughs> it's growing up, Scooter. This is coming from a, a severe Barbie collection. Thank you, growing okay. up, Scooter. But, but Sugar's not. daddy, can. Sugar's daddy. Sugar's daddy, because it's the dog. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes. That is the whole point. Oh, it is the dog, but the also dog. Um, in the queer community, yes. we have some. Oh, I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So they come together to save the others, and once you are liberated, you join the revolution <laughs> to liberate everybody. No Barbie left behind. And personally, I feel that is a super important uh, part of it because it is the response to girl boss feminism, where we don't forget that we need to make it possible for people to join us. And uh, I'm I'm ranting, but I feel like it's really important that that is kind of a thing led by a queer woman and a woman of color, <laughs> and like the white lady Barbies are being saved. So um, anyway, (laughs) we are getting close on time, so I'm sort of rushing along. Oh, Oh, can we roll over? You can roll over. And we are kicked out of the hotel until like tomorrow at 8. Oh, great. I'm going to slow down a little bit. So, um, (coughs) can you make a comment? Yes, I just wanted to make a comment. that um, at one point in my life, I talked to psychologist, a psychologist, mm. and um, uh, she gave me something that was so simple that I never considered because I'm one of those people that consider myself a perfectionist, so I was always mm-hmm. going to the end degree. And she taught me the concept of the good enough standard, mm-hmm. and so. I think that's important for anyone to learn in any level of mm-hmm. their life, mm-hmm. male or female or whatever gender you are, any gender, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, is that you 
have the power, if you have the power and guts to decide for yourself what's good enough, mm -hmm. that's the standard. Yes, there may be the business world, the corporate world that has their standard, but you decide for yourself what's good enough for you. Can I? Can I? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really good point. I just wanted to throw that out there because it, it gets so dismissed. Yeah. And, oh, and it's just, like you said, so much permeates the concept of perfection and having to smile at work. And what a luxury to have a boss or, or a leader who understands that their most important job is to facilitate their staff who's doing all the work mm -hmm. and it's good enough. Yeah. Yeah. I have a friend who says don't let perfect get yeah. in the way of good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I personally, I, re I reject the whole floss concept. Yeah. And, you know, I, when it comes to people, you're who you are. And can do we all have work to do? Yeah. And that's part of life. You're supposed to go to bed tonight a different person than you woke up. That's mm -hmm. being a human being. But you got to here, and that's perfect for now. Tomorrow, that'll be perfect too. It's, it's, you know, I don't know. None of you guys are fun. Aw, thank you, Barbie. Nice. Thank you, Barbie. <laughs> so... Do you need a tissue? So since we have... Link again. Since we have more time than I thought, I want to slow us down a little bit because I think it's really important. Um, first of all, just honestly. Oh, stop it, Barbie. This is perfect. Squad goals. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I want to slow it down a little bit and come back to the diverse Barbies and, in conjunction with talking about what is flawed? Is it does it even exist? Are we all not perfect in and of ourselves as we are who we are? But, um, Tanya, uh, I'm sorry, not Harvey. Harvey. It was your first time watching the film last night. And yeah. you said some really lovely things. So I'm going to pick on you. Okay. You're welcome. You're and I'm coming for you too. <laughs> <laughs> I come for everyone like death. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, Daryl's like, when they had the montage of like, you know, the Supreme Court and the president and the reporters and like the Nobel Prize winners and people making speeches like, thanks, I worked really hard and I deserve this. <laughs> and then when they had Lawyer Barbie, who's, you know, a lar who has a larger body type. Who's up there and she's dressed fabulously, her makeup is great, and she's just speaking about how like, yeah, this is, I don't remember exactly what was said because I was having a lot of feelings. <laughs> <laughs> she was speaking very confidently and knowledgeably and being basically like, yeah, this is how it is. And then you see like all this other array of Barbies in like different skin types and body types and wheelchair Barbie and it was just so good and then such a fun moment later whenever like uh, like periodically <laughs> the president she's like I mean the president's here and she's like that's right you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> and it was just so cool because like I am so happy for kids that get to see this movie mm -hmm. because there's a lot of things that I've had issues with like my whole life, and if I had seen stuff like that when I was younger, I think it would have helped a lot. And like, I follow a disability activist on social media who has talked about like how cool it was to see a wheelchair army. <laughs> so yeah, that was just, it was so good. It was very powerful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah powerful, funny, 
it pinched a little bit, right? Yeah. Yeah, but but you just kept coming back to it didn't, we were talking earlier, it didn't take itself too seriously, right? But no. even though it was so serious. It totally made fun of itself on purpose. Yeah. Because really a lot in our culture, we tend to be able to talk about the serious only through comedy. And that's when the real truth comes out. Mm -hmm. And the Barbie mm -hmm. movie really made fun of itself so that people could have it more palatable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like that's the one thing that had to do like with lawyer Barbie. A friend of mine who he's just a gorgeous plus size burlesque performer had posted something saying that one of the things she valued the most from the movie was to get to see a fat woman exist in a world and was not played for laughs. She always looked fabulous. Yes. Mm -hmm. And she was treated as an act like a regular person. It was no big deal that she looked different from so many people. And I was like, oh, I, I will. Because it's like one of those things where like mentally like, I'm going to remember that for later. And last night when I watched, I was like, oh, I have to talk to her about this. <laughs> <laughs> because I think representation does matter. We've talked about that a lot in many of our panels this weekend. Um, and so on one hand, Barbie land is a utopia. It is impossible. And there, and yet, even though it's a utopia, it is flawed. And there are problems because they are forgetting to make sure that they are actually helping other people. They've forgotten that connection. Uh, that's so critical, I think. But also, it is aspirational, and sometimes we need that. And, and I think as real people in the real world right now, it's aspirational to see ourselves present and celebrated and normalized in a space that is about something that represents ultimate beauty, ultimate glamour, ultimate, ultimate, ultimate thing you can be as a fat person. At, like, Listen, I generalize. Of course, there are lots of things, but this is sort of like the package of Barbie, right? <laughs> you haven't seen it yet, so I understand that like you haven't yet had this experience. You can't maybe speak it directly to the film, and if you you don't have a comment, that's fine. But I don't want to leave you out of the conversation because yeah. I respect you and I. Appreciate your time. I've seen snippets of it, and talking about the, the opening, I, I did see that. Thank you for the TikTok. Thank you. Thanks, TikTok. <laughs> um, I it didn't happen that I, I I wasn't able to get it to go, but I wanted to take my mom, my sister, and um, I have nephews, but they each have partners, and I'm like, you ladies need to come. I was going to bring every lady I could. It didn't happen, but I was like, we all need to go see this. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm not going to figure it out. I've got a mom. Big TV. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Have a Barbie party. Yeah, yeah. Barbie party. That's what I did. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I these young ladies that, um, my nephews, their partners, they're amazing women. And I just want them to know how amazing they are. Mm -hmm. You know, I see young girls grow up, and I want them to know how amazing they are. Um, you know, because, you know, like you, I didn't have that growing up. I mean, my parents were amazing. They said, you know, you can do anything you want. My dad and dad, make sure you didn't have math. <laughs> God. I totally agree on that one. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, they always said you could do anything you wanted to. And um, I was very fortunate growing up. My my mom, both my mom and my dad were like, do anything, I'm here that you're a girl. That's wonderful that you had that support, Barbie. Um, for me, seeing a form of myself in the film was so validating. I'm a performer, Barbie, as well as deranged and obnoxious Barbie. It's really helpful as a performer to have those qualities. <laughs> People love it. Um, but I'm also uh, disabled, 
and fat and queer. And I got to see some of all of that. Um, and it's so rare to see that in any kind of media in a respectful um, way where it's not played for laughs or played for like, you know, this thing that happens, like inspiration porn essentially, or where people are like, oh, it's, <coughs> look at how good you are. You, you really inspire me. I'm like, not if you hurt me in the morning. You'd be like, I have to wash my brain out after hearing the way you talk about your cane. And I'm like, yeah, it's bad in the morning. I don't like it. But uh, to have that and to see that as something I can aspire to, a world maybe I can help facilitate for other people, and that it should be our world. That should be the goal. Yeah. yeah to add on to that, you know, you just being capable of not. You know, I, I don't watch a lot of TV shows. Mm -hmm. I don't watch, you know, I watch anime, I love documentaries. I don't watch a lot of media that's going on because I don't see myself. And when I see a, a plus size woman, it's the butt of the joke. Mm -hmm. Or a plus size, whatever mm -hmm. gender they are, mm -hmm. pisses me off. I'm like, why am I gonna, deal with this. Mm -hmm. You know, there's other things that I see that make me uncomfortable, so I don't watch it. You know, that's a rule I give myself. Okay, I'm just not going to partake in it. You know, that's why I like the anime. I already know it's going to be crazy pants. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and so, when you bring it on, at least it's fun. You have to watch the pretty pictures. <laughs> and sometimes the delightful stories, too. Yeah, yeah. So, I want to get into Gloria, played beautifully by America Ferreira, and uh, who is a middle-aged woman, a woman of color, acting in Hollywood. She's had a long career. She has, I'm just contextualizing this for the conversation, she faced a lot of interesting discourse around her person as she was coming up, the media really obsessed on her weight, the way she looked. Oh, at first she was like, oh my gosh, empowering plus size actress. Oh my gosh, two plus size, not enough plus size. Is she still a plus size actress? Is she dieting? Has she lost weight? Oh my gosh, look at her glow up now. She can be a romantic heroine. And as a performer, who is roughly her age, watching her go through that, in synchronicity at the same time of life as she was looking through, I was like, always had a lot of compassion for this actress. She's also incredibly talented, and I felt like she brought all of her lived experience to this role, um, and I know that she also brought some editorial oversight to her role really? and changed some things and <laughs> impacted like the speech and like you know suggested some changes to make her character a little bit more what it needed to be. I'm glad they let her do that. Yeah, same, same. So, thank you, Barbie. So, Barbie. Yes, Barbie. Thanks. Let's talk about that speech. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, I think all of, all of these things we're told we're supposed to be, right? In, in one great speech, all of the angst we feel over how do you navigate being a leader, but being a team player, but not being too pretty, you don't wanna you know, be too attractive, but you still have to look good for your man. You know, all of that, I think, um, for me, it, as I said before, um, just culminated in, into this feeling of, wow, I've been carrying this around. I didn't know I was carrying it around this much and how much it was bothering me until I heard her say it, mm -hmm. you know, and how much of pressure I was putting on myself, right, for not, not being thin anymore, right, and I'm not young anymore, and I don't quite feel as pretty as I used to, and what does that mean for me in society, and can I be a leader, and can I do these things? And so I guess my point is it, it really hit me in a personal spot, and um, I felt like it was just beautifully done. You know, it just 
really, um, I think, speaks to a lot of different women. You know, it. I think all of us had talked about how we could relate to that speech. Yeah. Thank you, Marty. You're welcome, Marty. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's funny because, like, there are some aspects of it, but of the speech where it's like, you know, looking a certain way or whatever. And, you know, some of it where it relates to, like, makeup and things. I, it's basically one of those things where, like, not, not everything applies, but enough of it applies. Where when she starts to talk and you realize where it's going, it felt like a physical blow. <laughs> and I was like, oh. Because, yeah. And there was even a poem that was going around a few years ago that it just reminded me of. And if I remembered it that this morning, I could have looked it up and told everyone who it was by. But it went in that same vein. And there had been a video that was made. Somebody took that poem and they hired actresses to, to say to say different and edit it to say different lines. Where it's like that that it was that whole thing, like, well, you know, and it came down to like being a woman is impossible. Mm -hmm. Because there's too many contradictions. Just in general. And I was like, yeah, there's some of those things that I've gotten to the point where I don't care anymore. But in other ways, it's like, yeah, that's really fucked up. Because if I don't, I mean, I might not care about it, but that doesn't mean the rest of society stops caring. Yeah. And I've been very, very fortunate to be in spaces where, like, now, like, as an adult, where people aren't being so terrible in that way. And yet, I will, wow, I'm like, I'm like uncomfortable truths, Barbie. <laughs> yes, I changed my name to that. Yes, yes you are. Uncomfortable, <laughs> uncomfortable truths, Barbie. As a big girl, I can say sometimes, um, I don't know if it's this Jupiterian vibe I put out people, or I look like a mom, but people are like comfortable to come up and talk to me. We've been talking about that, right? So it actually brings people to me sometimes, right? And people will come up to me in the airport and be like, can you take me to baggage claim? Uh, I'm not kidding. Um, but at the same time, in the airport, I have to be careful because am I going to take up too much room and be that person on the plane? And I actually had somebody look at me and ask for a seat change. So uncomfortable truth, is Barbie. Um, and I guess where I'm going with it is that yeah, not everything from that matches up, but there's enough of it, right? That it hits home and it hits hard, and um, and. Even if you don't see yourself that way, other people still judge you that way, mm -hmm. right? And that's where I didn't look like the perfect person, and I even bought two seats that day, <laughs> you know, just to be careful and uh, not be that girl. And um, I guess my point is, like, people still have that inner monologue in their head when they're looking at you, and you have to be like, hey, fuck off. Yeah. 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 The thing that I mentioned at the beginning of the movie last night, uh, to uh, I can't. To Barbie. <laughs> yes, Barbie. <laughs> was that I like that I really love Helen Mirren has been quoted as saying that if she could go back and tell her younger self anything, it would be that she needed to tell people to fuck off more often. <laughs> and I thought it was really, really awesome that she's the one doing the voiceover for the Barbie movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and super self-aware. Mm -hmm. Barbie, would you like to weigh in on this? You know, I've always been a big girl growing up. My dad was also um, overweight. And I remember him sitting me down and telling me, people will judge you because you're big. So you have to always dress nicely. You have to have your hair washed, your clothes, 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 but what I've learned as I've gotten 
remember. So I just don't care. <laughs> you know, I had one guy, you know, he, was, he told me I was fat. And I'm like, what? And I looked down my shirt. Oh my God, what did that happen? <laughs> expecting me to cry or whatever and I was like bring it <laughs> I'm dealing with schmucks like you all in my life and I just you know what you were saying just reminded me of and with the speech was you know my dad had to get into that speech and he wasn't doing it to be mean he was trying to save me from he was trying yeah. to build a little armor yeah and he did and it worked but then I got older and I learned the value of not giving a crap what people say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, learned, I learned that when you're skinny, because I got very skinny at one point, when you're skinny, you feel just the same way. It doesn't change. And the expectation, expectations the rest of the world tries to put on you isn't any different. And you can be as thin as, as a stick and they'll still call you fat just yeah. to make you feel yeah, bad. Make you feel bad. Yeah. 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 So, Oh, go ahead. Along the lines of like the, the contradictions, it's like growing up, because um, I've also always had a larger body. Mm -hmm. and But it's like, I, I have parents who were not that gracious. And sometimes, and my, my mom would be, sometimes it's like, why aren't you wearing anything that fits? And I'm like, well, because. And I also, um, developed early mm -hmm. so it was why aren't you wear you should wear some clothes that fit and I'm like I don't want to because people will stare at me and then it would be like well then I so then she's like oh okay and then it's like well those clothes are too fitted it's like you made them <laughs> because she she sewed a lot she was a seam, uh, seamstress or sewist I suppose it's more widely used now but she made a lot of her clothes, but those were some of the contradictions that I just that I grew up with. And it's like, and I, like, just leave me alone. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't start wearing like cuter things because I also there was also the idea that if you were a certain size, you could not wear anything cute. Yep. Yeah. And I didn't actually start realizing that that was allowed until I was in my twenties. Yeah, patriarchy sucks balls. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does, Barbie. Mm -hmm. Thank here, you. Here, here, Barbie. Here, here. Um, I had a lot of experiences that overlap with y'all in different ways, Barbies. It's sometimes a trick and a challenge to be a fat body person in this world, regardless of your gender identity. Mm -hmm. And uh, armor will only get you so far. Yep. Camouflage will only get you so far. Diet will only get you so far. In a society bent on trying to mold you into an impossibility of perfection, this speech really shows that up. Mm -hmm. That this prison of perfection was always a lie. That you can't even achieve it. It's not possible. You'll never be that. So why try? Maybe be yourself. And I think one of my favorite things about having achieved this time in my life is how very few fucks I have to give. <laughs> so uh, my grandmother Barbie, Grandma Barbie, told me a long time ago, the 40s are the best because in your 30s you still care. <laughs> and once you hit 40, you know exactly what you want and you still have the energy to do it. <laughs> and you know what, Grandma Barbie, you were right. <laughs> it's great. What did Grandma Barbie say about 50? I know. <laughs> right. I'm right there. Okay. So, uh, my, suspense, my suspicion, Grandma Barbie accidentally met a child at 41 and 42. Mm -hmm. So I think she said about 50. My goodness, birth control would have been lovely. Mm -hmm. I love my children, but maybe 10-year-old <laughs> at age 50 is more than I thought I was going to do. Oh, and your Grandma needed to talk to my Grandma. Right. Uh, but, <laughs> 
so I, I, I think that she was a parent in her 50s, and so that probably changed things. But also, uh, the access to tools to help you have energy in your 50s probably is more now than it was for her. Absolutely. I, so. I, I agree. The 30s, yeah. we're, we're pretty cool. You are a lot better in the 20s. Right. I think the 40s have been real glorious. I just assume it gets better and better. And I look at Helen Mirren and I'm like, yes, queen. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I'm headed. Yes. So now, all of us Barbies mm -hmm. need to kick out the patriarchies that are trying to take away our ch right to choose mm -hmm. when we're going to have children or when we're not going to have children. Or just the autonomy to choose anything for our bodies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. So I Thank you, I'm changing the subject, but um, who was your favorite character in the film? Okay. Well, all hmm. right. That's a Cause great. Because I, I want to know. <laughs> yeah. This we, Barbie wants to know. Thank you, Barbie. <laughs> and we, we've covered a lot of heavy stuff, so I think it's fun mm -hmm. to bring it back to some of the lighter stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Goth Barbie, who was one of your favorite Barbies in the film? Weird Barbie. <laughs> should, shouldn't we re-ask that question? Other than Weird Barbie. Because <laughs> 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 it's my favorite, yeah. Barbie. What's your second favorite? Alan. 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 She, was, she didn't have a lot of scenes, but they, everyone she had was kind of gold. was President Barbie. President yeah, Barbie. Barbie! Oh my gosh, it's a really did such a great job in that role. She's amazing. You know, just for like the comic relief, Will Ferrell's character was hilarious. Mm -hmm. My head canon mm -hmm. is that the CEO of Mattel in the movie was an escaped Ken. <laughs> <laughs> placeholder, you know what I mean? And just like, you know, this basic turb and not have anything special to say, but like when, even when she was being snotty, when um, Barbie first went up to her, you know, and she put her down in her place, I was like, I like this girl. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to um, take a moment to talk about that because I did sort of skip over this uh, section. Frankly, I, I put together an outline that's more like a doctoral presentation <laughs> of Barbie, so I, I followed it. But um, have you heard of the Brat Stalls? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so the Brat Stalls were kind of like an antithesis to the Barbie dolls. Very mm -hmm. 90s and early aughts, right? Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> so did you realize that uh, her daughter and her friends are the Brat The Brat Stalls? No, I didn't. Oh, yes. my God. I, now that you say it, yeah. 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 I saw that pretty way. Yes. Yeah. Right They're the brats. And so she is really bratty. She also has a lot of great points. Mm -hmm. She is definitely, like, angry about the failure of second-wave feminism. Mm -hmm. And she's mm -hmm. like, let me tell you all about it, stereotypical Barbie and how you failed. And uh, stereotypical Barbie does what? She cries, cries. Mm -hmm. big white lady tears, mm -hmm. and um, and she's hurt, and she's fragile, and she runs off, but she does something important. She learns, she grows, she changes, mm -hmm. and that is why the movie is good, in part to me, this yeah. is my opinion, but I think if you don't have that change, you're just like, oh yeah, poor fragile, stereotypical Barbie. And uh, I think that the brats are part of the hopefulness. Even though uh, they also fail in some big ways, mm -hmm. but she's such a great character. Yeah. And like, there's this moment 
where finally Gloria and her daughter yeah. have a connection. Mm -hmm. And that is like coming, for me, that's coming back around to how important connection and community actually is to uh, confronting the challenges and improving on what is wrong. That's really well said. Thank you, Barbie. You're welcome, Barbie. Thanks for letting me like take what you said and run with it. <laughs> it's like if they're the brats, then once they're in Barbie land and they're trying to save all the Barbies, her doc isn't her daughter the one who points out that like, well, you gave the speech that fixed her. Yes. Yeah. So like, if we go around and we grab all the other Barbies, you can just keep doing it. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Really beautiful. So thanks for asking us about our favorite, by the way. Um, I mean, like, weird Barbie. Come on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Barbie. I just love her so much. Weird Barbie is everybody's favorite. I would like to date weird Barbie. <laughs> I don't know where we're at. I think we should probably skip over the Kens because, like, that's a whole out of that mojo dojo casa house and uh, run on down the street um, and wrap it up. One thing I did want to mention about the whole Ken stuff is I, you know, like, having only seen it last night, I haven't managed to avoid any really huge spoilers about, like, what happens. I just, want, watching them walk down the street together, <laughs> the thought that I had last night was, oh, Ken's going on a journey too. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then Ken gets to change. Lots yeah. of, and lots of times out loud, I was said, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Honestly, <laughs> no. <laughs> can I put you on the spot for a moment? Mm -hmm. I can. Thank you. So we were talking earlier in the dealer room. And um, we were talking about, uh, with another person, about the ending where, you know, they're showing the pictures of the real world. Can you share about that? Just because I think it's really cool. Yes. So um, it, was, it was interesting. Uh, my friend Zuli, I took her to go see it for her birthday. I have seen it four times. I got to see it for Burnaby. I posted in a special preview on a Wednesday. Oh, cool. So I am a super party person. Um, so, of course, she's like, I really want to see this movie. And I'm like, of course I'm taking you to the Barbie movie for your birthday. We're going to have a Barbie, like, birthday. So I take her, and she sees it, and we're crying. And our friend, who's a Ken, he's crying. I'm, you know, we're all crying. And she says, I just had one problem. And it's the end where Barbie, here's a big spoiler. <laughs> Barbie goes to the real world, but like, like, and gets the chance to stay there. And there is a montage of all of these family moments and people and laughing and children and happy crying and, and different things like that. And she says, I just, I just didn't like that when uh, Ruth Handler, which is Ruth Handler, is the creator of Barbie, <coughs> if you don't know. And she says, I want to show you, if you want the chance to be real, here's what you need to see. This is what really being a human, the breadth of, of emotion and experience. And she sees all these, and she gives her these images. And she says, I just didn't, I didn't like it because there was just like, you know, you saw a lot of happiness, and um, and it just wasn't real. And I said, but it really was real, because Greta Gerwig made sure that those scenes were real from people in her crew. And so what she did was she got people from the movie that had created it, crew members, not just actors, but everybody from the movie, and she said, I want to make this, um, I, I want to do this thing. She didn't tell him what she was doing. And she says, I want to do this thing, and I, I want all of us to really feel human in this film. 
and I want you to give me footage of real life, impactful, emotional, important human experiences in your life. Please give them to me. She didn't tell them what that she was going to do with it. They thought maybe it's going to be like a, oh, let's let's have like a, a bonding experience, you know, like that kind of thing in any kind of thing you work with. She didn't tell them. She only told like two other people and the editor, and they spliced their real human experiences into the film and then showed them during the preview. Mm. And they got to see themselves and their family there. And that was their real human experience. And I said, you know, even though, <laughs> I, said, I said, even though, you know, it looked just like the happy moments, I said, but that's what they had. You don't go filming people, here, somebody's dead. I'm going to film you crying. <laughs> you know, you don't, you, don't have, you don't save those. You don't want to save those necessarily on film. You want to save your happy memories or, you, you know, the different impactful experiences. So that's what Greta Gerwig did for her people because she wanted their humanness to truly show through the film. So that montage is fully real human. And what her people felt was their full human experience. And that is what I think is really important in the film, is because she wanted to make it as real as possible. And she really did. Those are not like stock footage. That's her people and their human experience. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Barbie. 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 I know the movie and I know you. Thank you, Barbie. <laughs> thank, thank you, Barbie. So there really isn't time to go into the Kens and their journey, but I do think that they are on a journey and that part of the real solutions, although I don't feel this movie is called any kind of action, it's just a meditation on things, but my personal take is that solutions are never confined to just one gender. We have a multitude of genders, we have to work together, patriarchy is bad for all of us, and the Kens have also been injured by that. I know that there are lots of a certain flavor of men who hated it, and I feel like the movie's really generous to men, and and very kind, and understands that they are also affected, and the Kens are part of that. Yeah. I just want to say, Barbie, as a as a man, I watched the film. I had high expectations of it, and I was blown away by how it dealt with everything, and it showed okay, it, it showed the vulnerability. Of, of multiple sexes in it, it and, and I was really happy with that to show change and, and, and acceptance in the end, you know, at the end of the film. Wonderful. One question that I kind of wanted to put you guys thought was like, were you really expecting so much emotional, so much deep philosophical stuff in such a pretty pink package. <laughs> <laughs> Not initially. All I had some warnings when I, <laughs> before I saw it. When I saw the previews, I did, because I, I looked and I thought, okay, interpolated, and I thought, okay, this is going to get deep. Because in my mind, it, was, it, it wasn't going to be so popular. If, if it hadn't been deep, it wouldn't have been such a hit. If it had just been light fluff, that's it. <coughs> I don't think it would have done so well. Yeah. And so as soon as I saw, and I heard people talking about it, and I'm like, okay, this is, I want to see this. You know, and, and I heard lots of my male friends also say, okay, I want to see this. Of course, my male friends are probably not typical male friends. <laughs> I, what is typical? I, I was expecting Kitsch, and knowing Greta Gerwig was involved, I knew it was going to have a punch. I didn't know she was bringing brass knuckles. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're rose gold, not gold fly, uh, <laughs> So thank you all for yeah. this. Thank you all for being here today at the end of the con. Thank you, TestCon.
<laughs> for having us. Thank you specifically to uh, Program Magic Barbie <laughs> in the audience. <laughs> who, uh, when I went to Program Magic Barbie and I said, hey Barbie, we want to do a panel about the Barbie movie. Program Magic Barbie was like you and me, and I was like, well, we could, but I was thinking with the Voynich Turtle Conservation Society Barbies, <laughs> uh, and the Hut Slayer contingent, <laughs> and um, I just, it's been a real privilege and um, like very profound to Thanks, share Barbie. this conversation. You're welcome, Thanks Barbie. everybody for staying late. Yeah, <laughs> thank you guys. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Barbies. And uh, mm -hmm. just want, for the record, I was ready to wrap it up on time. And I appreciate we got to that later. And I respect, I respect you so much for being vulnerable enough to turn into the plant Barbie. Yes, the plant Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, or Precious Moments Barbie, as uh, my dear Ken, uh, the Grand Arbiter, <laughs> likes to say. <laughs> well, what's up with guillotine Barbie? OK, listen, I was first French Revolution Barbie. <laughs> very much. Uh, maybe we can bring back the Kens for next year. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? In, the, in the meantime, we can uh, embrace our, our Birkenstocks, Barbie. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's end of the convention weekend. I'm really keen on Birkenstocks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in some Birkenstocks, Barbie. I, 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 think, I, I think, think next year it should be the Kens as an LGBT boy band. I mean, uh, I'd like that just period. That's I like that sounds perfect. Yes, that, I mean, like, that doesn't need to be a panel. That needs to be a reality. <laughs> Thank you. Well, please, um, I'm going to say to you all what I say at the end of all of my live streams and all of my events since we were wrapping up TuscCon and because. Uh, program Magic Barbie will let me get away with a whole lot. <laughs> um, I do feel that a lot, by the way, and I'm super grateful. And you're all letting me get away with monopolizing sometimes. <laughs> um, so um, I'll probably cry, so bear with me. <laughs> I think it's really easy sure. to sometimes forget what we have been through and to pretend like it hasn't happened the last three years. And I think it's really easy to want to put a little veneer over it and pretend like everything can go back and be perfect. And it can be really easy to want to return to that status quo. And we can't. But I'm so grateful that we can be here together at TuscCon 50, that it survived through the pandemic, <laughs> that we all survived, each of you, each of you. I see all of you. I'm glad you're here. And so I want to remind you to treasure yourselves as I treasure you, that you are irreplaceable. Oh. And so you need to wash your hands. Wear a mask when you feel like you need that for safety. Get your boosters. Get your vaccines. Take care of yourselves. Drink the good tea. Wear your favorite eyeliner. Dress up in your best shirt. Have fun with your friends. Because life is short and ephemeral. And I want to have tea with all of you. Thank you for great. spaces where all of us would just feel comfortable sharing like personal details and crying and passing tissues but I really like it <laughs> I'm glad that all of us feel like safe and comfortable enough to do that welcome to your tribe Barbie yeah. <laughs> thanks Barbie <laughs> all right you all you better be back for Tuscom 51 
And uh, that means taking care of yourselves. We still have a couple tissues left. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Harvey, for bringing us extra tissues. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, please check out D&D Journey of the 5th Edition and Ragnarok and roll a Scion Hero to Ragnarok Story. Also, check out our Patreon page for more content and behind-the-scenes things, as well as joining us for a one-shot game or two.